Hey everyone, it's Robin, R. Silent Crafts, and welcome to my studio. Today I have a very beginner-friendly project for you guys. Another one that is going to work well for the gift-giving season. If you or someone you know has stacking pans, where you have three or four pans that stack together, you know how easy it is for those pans to get scratched up. It's really great to have something in between the pans to protect them, and that's what we're going to make today. We're going to make a pan liner that's going to protect your pans in the cabinet. As a very beginner friendly project, it does have a couple steps to it, but I think if you take your time and go step by step that it is very beginner friendly and that anyone can go ahead and accomplish this. I'm going to give some tips and tricks and a couple of things that you can cut out if it's just a little bit too much for you and you need it to be a little bit easier. For those of us that have made dozens and dozens and dozens of bowl cozies, this project is going to be super easy. I no longer have a set of stacking pans. When my children moved out, I gave them some of my better pans that I no longer needed to use, and then the ones that were still in good condition that, again, I no longer needed and my kids didn't want it, they went to Goodwill. So we're gonna use a little bit of our imagination here, but the process is going to work for your set of stacking pans or for the ones that you wanna make for a gift. Now, if this were a set of stacking pans, I'd have the large pan on the bottom, and then I would have a medium size and a small that would stack together. If I were to put this metal pan right into this, it would scratch my Teflon surface. It's not really safe to have scratched Teflon. They recommend that if your Teflon gets scratched to go ahead and replace it. And also, it really messes with the non-stickness of the non-stick pan. So having pan liners would be very beneficial. When I've purchased stacking pans, they've always come with like cardboard inserts to protect the pans and shipping. And that's what I usually just left in there. But if you have any type of oil or grease that's still in a pan that you might not have gotten perfectly cleaned, or if you're using maybe cast iron pans, that cardboard would constantly be absorbed in the oil. And that's really not a safe thing because you can't wash cardboard. Well, you could, but it wouldn't survive. So to be able to stack all these pans together, it's nice to have that pan liner. We're gonna pretend I have stacking pans and I'm gonna give you all the information you need and the techniques to make it, and then you can make it based on the sizes you need. If you wanna make this for a craft fair, for your Etsy shop to sell online, or to give as gifts, you can always base it on the pan sizes you have, or check different stacking pans that are available at walmart.com or Amazon or somewhere else online, or even just go to the store. But you'll be able to get the measurements straight from the website so you don't have to play the guessing game. Now today I'm going to make square pan liners. You can use a circle if you like, but I find it just as easy to make the square one and I don't have to worry about drawing circles and cutting around circles or anything like that. If you prefer the circular version, you can always use the lid to give yourself that nice circle, especially since they come in gradiating sizes. As with any of my other projects, if this is the first time I'm making something and I'm trying to figure out exactly what size I'd like to make it, I prefer to use fabric that's not my favorite fabric. Maybe I have some leftover scraps and random bits of fabric from previous projects. I can use that to double check my measurements to see if the size I'm using is the one that's going to work for me. That way, when I go to cut into the good fabric so that all of my pan liners match, if that's what I want it to happen, then I wouldn't have wasted any of that fabric. I also like to use some scrap paper and make a test pattern first before I even touch my fabric. As you can see, this one is just a little bit larger. It will stick up a little bit here. But remember, we have our seam allowances and everything, so that's going to shrink it down a little bit more than what we're looking at right here, which is why it's good to try a test design first. The first thing I wanna do is cut a square of paper out to create my pattern. I measure across the center of my pan. This pan is seven and a quarter. For this design, I added an inch just to cover all those different seam allowances and to take care of anything that might shift and I might have to trim it up or something like that. Now that's what you're going to do for whatever size pan you're doing. 
So if you have a stack of three pans, you'll need to measure your largest pan and then your middle pan so that you can make two pan liners. You could put one in the top one if you just want to maybe keep the dust off of it or something or to make sure that nothing is going to get into it or whatever, you know, be dropped on it or something. But basically, it really only needs two for a set of three stacking pans. So mine is seven and a quarter. That means I'm going to cut a square of fabric that is eight and a quarter square. So to figure out the size of my cutouts, I took my paper and I folded it in half one way, open it up and fold it in half the other way. Make sure you have nice crease lines there. And what we're going to do is on those little fold lines on our crease marks, that's where we're going to mark our notches. So I'm going to mark down from the top edge on each of these, I'm going to mark at the two inch mark. Mark that on all four. Now you can choose to have a wider little triangle cut out here or a little bit narrower. It's all up to you. Maybe if you have a larger pan, you might want it to be a little wider. If you have more of a smaller bottom pan where the sides come up higher, more of a like, what are they, saute pans or the similar to like a walk type thing where it has a large sides come up. Maybe you might want this cut out to be a little bit narrower. That's why using the paper is a really good idea to just kind of test it out. If you're just doing a standard frying pan set that has the 12, 10, seven inch, whatever those frying pan sizes are, just your basic simple cutout is going to work. So I've gone two inches down. Now for my top opening, I found that a inch and a half worked out really well. I did one with two inches and it was just a little bit too much. And I did one smaller with more of like an inch and that just didn't work out well. So I thought an inch and a half worked out really well. So from each side of the fold line, I wanna mark it at three quarters of an inch. Then I just connect the dots to create my little triangle cutout. Now you can cut out this one and then just trace it all the way around, but I found that it was really simple to just go ahead and mark each one. Making my own pattern like this made it a lot easier for me to adjust based on the pans I had on hand, the look I wanted, and again, I didn't have to draw a circle. Just cutting out a square is a lot easier than trying to figure out a circle that's going to fit for your pan. So then all you have to do is cut all of these out. If you're going to be making a bunch of these as a gift or to sell in your shop or at the craft fair, once you figure out your first set and you give it a test to see how it looks and how it works, then you could always take and make some type of a template, whether you can use some plastic like the plastic cutting mats that you can get at the Dollar Tree or even at Walmart and Target. Or maybe you have some of the plastic pattern making for quilting. I found that if you have a source for used x-rays, so if you have anyone that you know that works in the hospital and x-ray department, the used x-rays work fantastic for projects like this. And then after it's done, even if you just put it onto a piece of thick cardboard, then you can just easily trace these cutouts onto your squares so as you go. So you don't have to constantly keep measuring and making something like this. Even just having a pattern template works really well. Now for our supplies after that, it's really simple. You just need two pieces of fabric, one for either side of it. They're gonna to be totally reversible, so there's really no lining. So you have two outside pieces. And then I have one piece of batting. This is going to be going in between frying pans. We're not putting it in the microwave or anything. So any batting that you have will work. If you don't have batting, you can always use a piece of felt if you have it of the right size. So if you need to, you can always Franken piece it. So two pieces of batting together or two pieces of felt. 
you want something that's going to create that cushion to stop it from scratching one pan to the next. If I were to use just two pieces of fabric, it would be really easy for the pans to move and scratch with just two layers of fabric. If your batting is a little thin and you're a little concerned that it's not going to provide as much protection, you can use two pieces of batting, one on each side of your fabric. You can also use fusible fleece, put one on each side and you know you're going to have enough cushioning there and you don't have to worry about anything shifting while you're sewing because it's fused down. You can cut each layer out individually, but I'm going to go ahead and cut mine all at once. You can pin your pattern right onto it like this so that you can trace your marks and cut it out or you can just go ahead and pin your fabric and your batting knowing that these corners are not going to get cut out so I can pin there pop one in the center just for good measure Pan liners are great beginner sewing projects because they don't need to be absolutely perfect. If you pin all of your layers together, you can just pick up your scissors and cut it. The thing with a paper pattern though is if you use your scissors and you cut, if you start cutting into that point, you'll probably cut more and more into the paper and that is going to enlarge it. It's not a problem, but it does make it more even and more equally spaced all around so that they all look the same if you just kind of trace those spots out. You can do it on the batting or you can do it on the fabric side. Just cut these out. If you have nice sharp scissors that cut all the way to the tip, it should go pretty quickly. Remove our pins. If you have a spray adhesive, you can go ahead and use that to adhere the cotton batting or whatever batting you're using. You can use polyester, you can use wool. As I mentioned, you can put anything you want in there, a piece of felt. You can use maybe a couple layers of an old t-shirt or a piece of an old hoodie or something like that. Anything that's gonna give you that cushioning. So I have my batting and then I have my one of my fabrics face up. Then I'll put my second fabric right sides together. That is the way I had it when I cut all the pieces out. We're going to take this as a sewing machine and we're going to leave an opening on any of these long sides that you want. You want to stay away from the two corners. We're going to use that to turn it right side out. So you can add some pins just to hold everybody together. I like these nice longer pins. You can put clips on it, but if I use pins like this, then they stay out of my way and I don't have to remove them as I'm sewing. I'll put one in the center just for fun. I'm going to take this over to the sewing machine and you can sew it at a quarter inch seam allowance or if you want you can bump it up a little bit bigger and maybe do a 3 8 inch seam allowance. Sometimes when you're going through all of these layers and you have batting things might want to shift a little bit and it can be easier to sew a larger seam allowance. If you're using fusible fleece whether it's one layer or two everything stays together really nicely. You could pre-quilt one of the layers if you'd like, but I'm going to show you how to do a little bit of quilting when we're all finished with everything. If you wanted to pre-quilt your layers together, you could do like the bowl cozy and give it that nice X going down that way, and that will hold it all together. But at that point, you're just going to be quilting through one if you're only using one piece of batting. So you're only going to be quilting through one piece of batting and one piece of fabric. I'm going to show you how to do a little extra quilting on it when we're all finished just to keep all the layers together. Let's head on over to the sewing machine and we will stitch it around. I am going to use about a 3 h inch seam allowance. I'm going to use a 2.0 stitch length just to hold everyone together nicely. I'm going to stitch mine with the batting down touching my sewing machine bed here. But if you want, you can flip it over and stitch it the other way. I'm going to leave my opening right here. You can mark it with a couple pins or make a little mark with a pen, but I'm just going to start about an inch from the edge. 
back stitch a couple stitches now when we're sewing this one there is a lot of corners and points so we're going to do a lot of pivoting so you might not be able to do the speed demon if i'm stitching a quarter of an inch i want to stitch about a quarter of an inch away from this corner here and stop and pivot i'm doing three eighths of an inch so i'm going to stop about three eighths of an inch we are making pan linings. No one's gonna know if you did it at an exact three eighths or if you did it at a quarter or if you were somewhere in between. We just wanna make sure we have a nice seam allowance that's at least a quarter of an inch away from our stitching line. If you're concerned about getting it exactly right, when I stop, since I'm using the side of my presser foot, when I turn this, if the fabric is right at the side of my presser foot, then I know I've got it perfect. I am one stitch past, that is fine with me. As I start stitching, I'll just line it up here and keep going. When we get to this point, we wanna stop again, but this time we are going to stop at this point. So if you imagine a diagonal line, even if you drew one, you're gonna imagine that diagonal line right there. So when I get to it, I'm going to stop, lift my presser foot, my foot's off the pedal, spin my project, and then go again. And I'm consistently one stitch off, so that's perfect. Same thing here, we're gonna go off of this point right down that way. I wanna make sure when I get to this point that I can turn and then when I come back this way, that again, I have enough seam allowance. I am way off this time, so let me take another stitch or two. So then when I come back up, so I just kind of straighten it out a little bit to make sure I'm okay. And then I'll just continue stitching around, making those same little movements. Remove all of my pins. You see all my stitching around there. Now nobody's going to know if you didn't get it perfect. If you're a brand new sewer and it really bothers you if it's not perfect or you want to just practice and know that you're stopping in the right spot, you could always take your ruler. The quilting rulers have the quarter inch marks and the half inch marks and the three eighths and all of that on it. And then you just lay your ruler down and you can mark it a quarter inch or even a half inch inside from the edge and then draw a line straight right from one opening to the other. Then when you turn it down this way into these points when you mark it, you can draw a line there. Now if you use a marking tool that's meant for sewing, quilting, fabric, clothing, stuff like that. It'll erase with the heat like a friction pen. It's gonna be on the inside of the fabric. Or you can just use like a mechanical pencil or even a Bic pen, a regular ballpoint pen. You just don't wanna do maybe a Sharpie because it could bleed through. The ones that erase with heat or with air are really great. And then you can just continue to mark your line so when you're sewing you have a guideline to follow and you'll know exactly when you get to that point in the corner where you have to go ahead and pivot to get to the next side. So that's a great way to practice with your eye to give yourself that comfort level so if you're worried about messing it up. This is a pan liner. If you make a set for yourself first it's not that big of a deal if you mess it up. It's still gonna protect the pan, even if this opening is a little bit larger than this one, and then this one is much smaller than the other ones. It's still gonna work. Before we get going, I wanna show you what it looks like if you don't use those notches. If you were to put a, this one is an actual pot holder, so it's a little bit thicker than we need. I just don't have one that looks like that to show you. But if you use a full square, when you put it in, it's just gonna wrinkle up a little bit. It doesn't have that little cut out there, so it gets a little crinkly and it just kind of bunches up a little bit. But if you're a little nervous about doing those notches, you can just do a square and work your way up to those later on. A square is gonna work perfectly fine, especially if you're just using it for yourself and you just want it to work. 
even if making it as gifts, because these are thinner than this one here, this one has extra batting in it to make it heat protective for a pot holder. So when you put it in, it would just have extra bits that would kind of hold there. Because remember, you're going to put another pot on top of this that's going to hold it in place. So if you have a little extra, it's not going to matter. This is going to protect up the sides of your pans, and it's going to do what you need it to do, protect your pans. But if you want to move up to the next level and go ahead and put the notches, when we put this in, see how it sits much nicer? These pieces can open and close. It's actually this wide, but when we put it in, they come closer together and then it protects everything. If you're not doing the notches, you'll just leave an opening on one of your sides, back stitch, stitch all the way around. You're still gonna have to pivot at the corners. You're still gonna use about a 2.0 stitch length and you are going to use about a quarter inch up to even a half an inch if it makes it more comfortable for you on your seam allowance and then get back up to the corner pivot and back stitch. My opening is right here, but before I turn anything, I need to trim up my corners and I need to cut into this point a little bit. Just like what we do with any of our pouches or anything else like that, I'm going to trim these corners off to release some of the bulk in the corner. And I just wanna stay a little bit away from the stitching line. Some people like to go super close. I don't like to get too close. On all of these, I will be doing that. The other thing we need to do is we need to make sure we don't have too much seam allowance anywhere. So on this one, I didn't get it quite perfect. So I have a narrow seam allowance there and a little bit wider there. So I can trim this down to a quarter inch. That way I don't have that extra bulk in that seam when I turn everything out. So I'll trim all of these up. And if you have any extra along here, you can trim that up also. The only thing I recommend is where your opening is, where we're gonna turn it. Don't trim any of the seam allowance on here. Trim your corners, but leave this one open. If you'd like, you can trim some of that batting away just to reduce some of the bulk when we turn it. If you stitch a perfect quarter and seam allowance all the way around, you don't have to worry about trimming anything. Now, when it comes to this point right here, can you see how it really doesn't go all the way to the stitching? Right there stops it. I want to release the pressure here, and I'm just going to snip about an eighth of an inch away, and that's just gonna allow this to turn easier so that it can open up, releasing any of the stiffness there. It's the same theory as when you're clipping curves around a circular item so that it's able to turn nice and neat. Otherwise, you'll get a weird pucker in that one spot. Find your opening. You can use hemostats. If it's a larger one, it's usually easy to put your fingers in. Just get to one of the opposite corners. Pulling this out is going to take just a couple minutes. We wanna turn everything right side out through this opening. And when I went into it, I made sure I went between two pieces of fabric. I didn't go between the fabric and the batting. If you can't get your fingers to fit into your opening to grab the corners, you can always use a pair of hemostats. They have crafting ones and medical ones. They're easy to find on Amazon. You wanna make sure you have your four little legs out. As you can see, mine aren't all the way out. You can use a point turner. They come in a variety of designs and shapes and colors. Mine's a flamingo. My favorite is always the crochet hook because it has a nice rounded corner so I can push a little bit firmer and not worry about poking through the fabric. So go into your opening and you want to bring out all of your corners. Again, it might take you a minute just to fuss with it and to get everybody out. You don't want to push so hard that you're going to end up poking through your fabric. If you do, you'll have to turn it back out and sew that seam again. With the crochet hook, I can just run it along here and find all of it. I run it along the edge. Even if you don't crochet, you can always pick one up inexpensively at Walmart or somewhere. Because we trim those corners off, we don't have a lot of fabric that is stuck in that corner. 
You just want to make sure they're out as far as they can, again, without forcing the fabric. So we end up with a design that looks like this. Now I want to go to my opening where I turned everything and make sure that those little seam allowances are pushed in. You could put a couple pins or a clip on there, but I'll take it over to my iron and I want to give it a nice good press and I just want to make sure that everything is laying nice and flat. Can you see how our corner doesn't have any puckers there? This one here looks like it has a little bit of puckers, but once I take it over to the iron, it's going to iron it out. And once again, if you do have some puckers, if it bothers you, you can turn it right side out and take another couple little snips with that corner area there. Just make sure you don't snip through your stitching line. These are gonna be pan protectors. If I'm using it just for my house, I'm not gonna to worry too much about that. Gave it a nice press. I started in the center and I just pressed out to the points that way to get everything to lay nice and flat. I have a clip. This is where my turning opening is. So I wanna make sure that I close that one up first. I'm going to top stitch all the way around doing the same thing like we did when we sewed it together, but this is just gonna hold everything down nice and tidy along those edges. If you don't wanna do that top stitching, you just need to make sure that this part here is closed up. If you're doing it for yourself and you don't really care what it looks like, you can just, if these are just for yourself and you're not too worried about everything being perfect all the way around, you can just do a line of stitching right across here or you can go ahead and whip stitch it or ladder stitch it close by hand. Many times the difference between something that is homemade and something that is handmade is the little touches. A lot of people expect to have that line of stitching that goes all the way around. They expect to see that in a well-made item. For us as the maker, it serves to close up that hole and then it just keeps that edge nice and neat so that it doesn't get any kinds of folds and twists and any weird wonky things. I'm gonna use a yellow thread because that matches my project. If you wanna hide your stitches, if you're worried they're not gonna be perfectly straight, then use the thread that matches in your bobbin and in your top. So there's that final touch, that top stitching all the way around. It closed up our opening hole. Now that's why we left that little extra there and we didn't trim our seam allowance. So that when we fold it in, that seam allowance will come down far enough. If we trimmed it too small, we would have to be really close to the edge. Now I just did the eighth of an inch. I stick with my 2.0 all the way around and I stitched all the way around it. Now you can leave it as is. I think because of the way the cutout is, it would be perfectly fine to leave it like this without quilting it. If you were to throw it in the washer, having this top stitching around it is going to keep it all together. If you're worried about any type of quilting, you could always just run a stitch line from this point to this, to this, to this, and make a square there. A very simple square. It doesn't even have to be exactly straight. Again, if you're concerned with the lines being perfect, I just started at a point and I aimed for the next one and then just stitched around. You can draw those lines with some type of a marking tool that isn't going to be permanent. This is a Hera marker. It allows you to use this to make a crease in the fabric and then you can just follow that crease with your stitching and you don't have to worry about having a mark possibly coming back or being seen at a later time. If I had a smaller pan to go on top, this one would now sit in there perfectly. It would protect this pan from the next one that's going in. I have a playlist that has a lot of quick and easy gifts that you can make for the holidays. I'll put a link down below in the description box to the handle cover. I think it would be a great matching set to make the pan liners to protect your pans and then to make a handle for each of the pans in that set that protects their hand from the heat of a handle. Because the handles do get hot even if they're just on the stove top. Your scrappy word for today is yellow. 
Thanks for hanging out with me. If you're looking for some more ideas on what to make, you can check out this video here or there. If you click on the little pink flamingo, you can subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any of my videos. If you'd like to get email notifications anytime I do put out a video, down below in the description box, the very first link is a link to a email notification system that I use. YouTube does not notify you by email, but if you ring the little bell, they will put it in your playlist and give you a notification on YouTube. As always, thank you so much for hanging out with me, for making it to the end of my video, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!